in all everybody of these my generations mind is, is how do we get the chances for younger people or people with a physical disability or people without much money how do we get them the chances to go to see and have some of these experiences that we've been hearing about today so there was one little story that Richard Woodman didn't tell in the last session which is when he was a 12-year-old schoolboy in Pinner, North London, with absolutely nothing about the sea in his background at all, nothing in his family life. And he read Arthur Ransom's book, We Didn't Need to Go to Sea. And as with so many people who read Ransom at an impressionable age, it absolutely changed his life. Um, so I'm terribly pleased that Peter Willis and Nancy Blackett Trust are not just leading our session now, but with the help of John over here, are going to try and make a little film that we can send out afterwards to schools, youth organisations, um, people who support other people who need that little bit of extra help. And we're going to try, with the help, we've got wonderful speakers here, and I'm just going to move probably quite irritating, but I'm just going to say that with Peter, we've got Leonie Back from the Curden Sailing Trust, and if I've said it once, I've said it a million times, you need to get down to the Suffolk Yacht Harbour and have a look at the wonderful yacht duet. And that being said, I'm very, very pleased to have Elizabeth Courtold with us, whose husband, Christopher, was such a philanthropist, such a benefactor to so many not just duet, but when my father was running a sailing barge trust, um, Christopher was there to help. I think he helped with the Nancy Blackett Trust in an early stage. We are proud that you're here. And the fact that you live in Arthur Ransom's house, Elizabeth, is just magic. It's absolutely <laughs> magic. I didn't realise when we bought the house that it was his. No, there we are. It was meant then, wasn't it? It was fate. It was God. It was something. And, with us also, we have somebody who I find absolutely inspirational, and that's Simon Dawes, because when Richard was talking in the last session about how you need to be looking and looking out, and Claudia was talking about looking at the sea and what it could tell you, and the most scary thing, I think, for many of us is what if you can't see anymore? And what Simon, accompanied by lovely Lamar, who is sitting there very quietly and... and um, supporting us all in his wonderful way, um, what, what Simon is going to talk to us about is if the worst happens, what can, how can you still keep sailing? So we've got a lovely session ahead um, and we'll just crack on. And so we're a little bit behind schedule, but never mind, we'll cope. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you everybody. Uh, is this thing working? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Right, well, uh, Julius uh, kindly introduced me only and Simon, so I don't have to do that. Um, and uh, this session actually follows on very strangely and, and coincidentally from all sorts of threads that have appeared or may appear during the course of today. Uh, in particular, uh, following on from the wonderful Richard Woodman has been particular pleasure for me because I still treasure the letter that he wrote to me when I was busy trying to set up or raise the funds to buy the Nancy Blackett. He wrote me this wonderfully stern letter explaining exactly why I should not do it. <laughs> <laughs> and funnily enough, I got a very nearly identical letter from Greg Palmer. Now, Greg Palmer is no longer with us. Um, Greg Palmer was the owner of Peter Duck in between Julia's parents owning Peter Duck and Julia and Francis and her immediate family re-owning her after she'd been to Russia. Greg had died of a heart attack. She had to come back, be restored, blah, 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 blah. And Greg said very much the same sort of thing that, that, that Richard had said. And said you know, surely find somebody, you know, five or ten who will let you have a go on at time to time. And um, he ended the letter, he said, um, if, as I suspect you will, you ignore all this advice, 
I shall be on, happy to be on hand to help you out. <laughs> uh, and I did. But sadly he wasn't because by that time he had stopped it. Anyway, um, 25 years ago the Nancy Blackett Trust did come into being and about 25 years, almost to the day today, we actually took over her in the Maritime Salix Witch Festival of 1997. Uh, but before that, going back a bit, she used to belong to this chap, Arthur Ransom. Mm -hmm. uh, Ransom moved down to these parts in order to enjoy some sea sailing and he moved to Oak House where our friend Scotholz now live. Um, he rented it. Um, he looked around for a boat to buy. Eventually somebody pointed to him, pointed him to one in Pool Harbour called Electron at the time, uh, a Hilliard Seven Tonner, which he liked. He immediately renamed her Nancy Blackett because as he said, uh, without Nancy, who had appeared in Swallows and Amazons, his first children's book, of which he was now up to about five, uh, I would never have been able to afford her. Um, so he, he bought her, he found a young crewman to assist her in, and sailed her, more or less single-handed, back to Finn Mill. Um, but it wasn't an easy journey. It was a bit of a, a passage of fire. And uh, this is uh, how he described it in a letter afterwards. We started out from Poole on September the 14th in the famous gale. Mm -hmm. They sheltered in Yarmouth while it blew through and then continued up channel, still in rough weather. Boats electrics failed and he describes himself as bucketing along in the dark, able to see the compass only by occasional flashes of the torch. And on that last wild night, the miserable navigation lights blew out, almost always the moment we showed them. I used a red bulbous Bakelite plate with a strong torch behind it to frighten off the flushing Harriet steamer. Three exclamation marks. <laughs> The scene that will be very familiar with readers. The readers will read it and won't go to sea. No, no, no. We didn't go to sea. And uh, he, he did all his own illustrations, by the way, Ransom, so the Simon's benefit. This is a picture of a massive, great steamer that's night with a time that's a yacht passing by and narrowly missing it. Um, uh, he summed up here. So here she is, after ten years with none, I've had a little yachting. It made me feel horribly old, but in a way very young and inexperienced. And in those last few words, uh, I, I think we can see the, uh, the seeds of how we didn't mean to go to sea came to be. Four children blown out to sea in the Goblin, identical in all respects to Nancy Blackett and having to get control of the boat, save her to Holland. It's all about mastering the elements, using lessons learnt, knowledge gained, skills acquired to cope with an extreme situation involving real danger. It's about test being tested and triumphing. For the young swallows, it was about moving from the comparatively safe confines of the lake in the north that they grew up on to the real world of tidal oceans, new shores, large threatening ships, and the uncertainties of entering a foreign port. In short, about growing up. Nancy herself, after Ransom sold her in 1938, this would be went through several different owners uh, before being found derelict in Scarborough Harbour in the late 1980s. Oh, yeah. oh. That's we didn't know to give us yet another of Arthur Anton's own drawings of that for the cover. Uh, it's my favourite version of a really different, didn't mean to go to sea cover. Um, 
Anyway, she was brought back, uh, back here to Mike Grimes, who lived in Broke Hall, or rather in the grounds of Broke Hall at the time. I mean, not like sheltering under a bush. I mean, uh, he had a bungalow there converted out of the dairy, uh, and another building next door with an atrium between the two. And very recently, he discovered that uh, there was a footpath running from the hall to Napton Village through the grounds which must have gone up through the atrium of Mike Grimes' bungalow. <laughs> and Arthur Ransom would have walked to the shops and back there on a frequent basis. <laughs> uh, Mike now lives in Woodbridge, but there we are. Um, anyway, Mike restored Peter Duck. No, sorry, Nancy Ransom. No, Nancy Ransom. Mike, uh, Nancy Blackett. Mike restored Nancy Blackett. Uh, but naturally, the cost saver ran and he had to sell her. Um, he sold her to a man called Colin Winter, who we lost track of. Colin Winter lent her to the Arthur Ransom Society in 1994. Are we going? No? No. no. Okay, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Here she is in Scarborough Harbour, falling to bits in the late 80s. Here she is on the back of a lorry being towed into Fox's yard by Mike Rhymes in 1988. And here she is, here she is, sailing in what came to be known as the Great Race with Peter Duck, Nancy Blackett. Somewhere in that rather murky scenario is a boat called Andromeda, owned by one Richard Woodman, who was the um, what do you call it, Julie, when somebody's in charge for a race? <laughs> Unlucky chap, I think. <laughs> Somebody in charge of the race. It was a brilliant yes. chart of the course, which was from Wolverston down to um, have it charred and back again. Officer of the day. Officer, Officer yeah, of the day. Yeah, probably, yeah. And he did it very well. And blow me down if Peter Duck didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, that was my own first actual personal acquaintance with Nancy Blackett. Um, a few years later she was put up for sale again and that was when I had a stupid idea of uh, inviting members of the Arthur Mansion Society to see if they would like to um, join a fund to buy her and preserve her. And they did. Um, uh, with a view to uh, find inspiring young people to, and, and not you so young, uh, to sail. And this is her sailing. Once we've got hold of her, as I say, 25 years ago, back to sail at switch. Here are some young people, and this is sort of brings the whole thing back to the sort of the literary festival aspect of the scene because these particular young people are none other than the cast that we didn't mean to go to see <laughs> when in um, 2017 I think it was on at the Hush House at Bentwaters uh, produced by Ivor Cutting for Eastern Angles and we took them out for a little trip on land sea to help them get their sea legs and understand what the boat was about and very much they did. And I'm very particularly proud to say that Nancy's even changed the perception of the local area. Uh, since 2017, she's uh, the, the name for this part of the world, or particularly the Shotley Bank of the Orwell, uh, has become known as uh, Arthur Ransom's East Coast. Uh, the council have even put up these massive signboards telling everybody about Nancy Blackett, about Peter Black. And as you see, Arthur Ransom's East Coast. She, she, she's kind of here to stay. Um, she's actually a, a rather ordinary little boat. The story is one of, of drama and romance. And she does have the power, strange power, to love and inspire all who, well, many who say in her. And it's marvellous that, uh, as Julia herself has put it, Readers as well as sailors can go on board and touch the very fabric of the vessel that has transported them across the seas in their imagination and to actually sail her. And 
Uh, members of the Nancy Bucket Trust, which is very easy to join. The young people who we try and um, lavish our any spare cash we have on. Uh, get up to sailing adventures of one sort or another, not necessarily on Nancy, but with the blessing of the Nancy Blackett Trust. And some of them even possibly end up on possibly. duet. Um, so that's Nancy Blackett for the time being. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Leonie Bell. But Leonie back, it says black on those things, but she's yeah, black clearly. <laughs> uh, he'll tell you all about to do it. Okay, thank you. Um, it's quite um, strange that I should be here with so much like Arthur Anderson today because um, this is totally irrelevant, I suppose. But on Wednesday at my father's funeral, and we cremated him with a copy of Swallows and Amazon. <laughs> So <laughs> it goes on, doesn't it? Um, well, Curden actually um, has got quite a, a literary connection, I suppose, because um, we were founded about 40 years ago by a vicar, um, vicar of, um, out on the Denji, and he didn't particularly want any recognition for what he did because he ploughed a lot of money into setting us up. But his one indulgence was the fact that he was a mad Tolkien fan and um, he, he just wanted to sort of bring that into the trust. So he called us Curden, which as a marketing person, I hate the name because it, nobody understands it, remembers it, unless they're Tolkien fans. Because Curden, if any, if any of you are Tolkien fans, Curden was the shipwright in Lord of the Rings. So... There you go. <laughs> um, the first boat that he bought, um, he renamed Queen Galadriel, and we subsequently had boats in Young Cab called uh, um, Arwen and Boromir. We now have a boat called Faramir, which um, I actually suggested the name when we had to rename her and we bought her, and my crew have um, told me off ever since because it's a man's name apparently, and boats are not men. Um, but in this day and age, does it matter? <laughs> we should go with, go with the flow, eh? Um, so, is this ready for me to now go on? Okay, so. Um, okay, so we're, we're a small charity. Um, we have been going for 40 years. And the whole point of the charity is that we take young people to sea to give them life experience. Um, Nearly all of the young people we take on our boats are disadvantaged in some way, with the exception of uh, some of them that we take on duets, which I'll come to later. Okay, we have three boats at the moment. We have gone through various boats in our time, and we've been up and we've had a fleet as um, big as five uh, when we were operating a boat for another charity as well. Um, but uh, recent times, uh, getting youth. Um, groups to actually participate in the sort of work we do has become more difficult uh, because of people being so risk averse. Uh, so at the moment we're down to a, a fleet of three which uh, serves us quite well. This is our largest boat, Queen Galadriel, she's actually a converted water trader. Um, I describe her to people as a scout hut on water because mm. down below she's really huge. Um, she's got a table that will seat um, about 26 people quite comfortably. Um, and she, when she was refitted some years ago, she, the, the down below was designed really mainly around the table to encourage young people to understand the need to sit around a table to eat a meal and talk to each other. So the next boat we have is Faramir. Uh, uh, she's more of a, a modern looking yacht. She's actually. Uh, was uh, built in 1982 and she was built especially for sail training uh, for an organisation called Shaftesbury Homes. Um, they named her Arethusa and well, unfortunately when we bought her from another organisation they wouldn't let us rename her, which I think is very sad because it, we still have a following of people that know her as Arethusa. And then of course the final boat we operate is Duet. Um, she is the smallest of our fleet but she's also the prettiest and she's probably the best sailor as well. She has been the um, overall winner of the tall ships races, the famous tall ships races. She's done the fast net, 
race. The last time she did the fastnet race was, I think, in 2016, and that is probably the last time that she will, because our insurers asked her not to asked us not to do it again. Um, she was pumped out rather a lot of times during the fastnet race, and she won quite a few prizes. I think you might still have some. Do you still have them, Elizabeth? Or yeah, I think you might still have some. Um, most of the prizes she won for were things like longest at sea and. Um, slowest in the race and things like that. Um, she was actually still going out past Land's End as the front runners were coming back. <laughs> um, so, um, but they had a fantastic time, um, and uh, you know we, we were really pleased that uh, that she did something like that. Um, I'll talk a bit more about Duet a bit later. Um, obviously, as a commercial organisation, we have to have all our vessels um, heavily uh, regulated. They're licensed by the MCA. Uh, we operate with crew who um, have to have all the checks to make sure that they're good for working with young people um, and the, the qualifications necessary to run commercial vessels. Okay, uh, I've just got a series of pictures which, you know, just to give you an idea of the sort of things we, we do. Um, here you can see young people in the chart room um, keeping logs. Some of these young people have probably never bothered to write anything at school. They're not interested in doing school work. They come on the boat, suddenly it has a purpose. So when they're asked to fill in a log, and given that responsibility of filling in an official document, uh, we ask them to do it. Obviously, it's, um, you know, we have to look at what they're doing. Um, you can see a chart in the background. Um, they are expected to work with the crew to plan passages, um, etc. Uh, in the galley, that's actually uh, Farami, uh, sorry, Queen Galapagos galley, which actually is um, wonderful because she's fully equipped for, the, for people to cook uh, big meals. So they are expected to bring along food, healthy food. We give them healthy menus to follow, um, and uh, they work with their group leaders because they come on board nearly always with teachers or youth leaders or clinicians, and they are expected to uh, cook. Uh, so we get things like pe people afterwards will say that after they've been on the boats, they don't want to become sailors, but they do actually want to go away and become cooks, chefs, uh, working pubs. Yeah, it's a job that you can do from working in a pub to becoming a top chef. So uh, it's something I think if somebody said what have most people got from it, it could probably be the cooking, which is not what we expect, but you know, that's what it is. Building confidence, this young man, these are all this year's photographs that have been taken um, in the last few months. This young man was so seasick for the first day and the first night, they were going to take him off, get him home. Um, it was all arranged, he was going to go home because he was really, really poorly. Uh, he wanted to stay on overnight, so he did in the morning. Luckily the weather brightened up a little bit. And there he is with a fantastic smile on his face. His confidence when he got off that boat was just amazing. He just went up to his mother and he said, I helmed the boat, I steered the boat all the way down there, it was great. And obviously on Galadriel we've got um, the rigging that, that uh, youngsters go up and conquer their fear of heights. Again, learning um, these young people in school would probably not sit quietly uh, looking over the map and uh, working stuff out. Obviously, teamwork and determination is what it's all about, isn't it? Um, on Galadriel in particular, you, you wouldn't go anywhere if you didn't all work together to raise the sails because she's a big heavy ship. Um, but generally, if you're sailors, you know if you don't work together, nothing's going to happen. On our boats, if they don't, if they don't work together, they won't eat, um, they won't go anywhere, and they will also be living in a mess because they have to do all their clearing up and cleaning as well. New interests, again these pictures were taken only a couple of weeks ago, young people in the engine room, um, the young man up there, he's from Youth Offending Team, he was fascinated by the engine room, hopefully he'll go back home, have an interest that uh, you know, might uh, keep him on the straight and narrow and hopefully take him into a career. Uh, moving on to what we were talking about earlier, everyone being able to take an opportunity to get on the water, most of our voyages are with groups. So we work with all sorts of different types of schools, um, special needs. The mainstream schools tend to bring the young people that need extra direction in life, um, rather than just the, the standard young person. 
We work with lots of young carers, youth offenders. Um, homeschooled is something that we're getting to see more and more of. Uh, long homeschooled children have, have not had the opportunity to socialise in the way that most other children do. Um, you get them on the boat and they suddenly realise they're living in a very close environment with other people and they've got to get on with each other. Um, we take small family groups. We took a family last year where there was a, a mother who um, was really worried about the, um, the relationship between her adopted son and foster daughter. She said, can they come on the boat? They want some duet. It was brilliant. They, they bonded so well. And in fact, the mother's come back as a teacher this year and she brought one of the groups that you just saw, a group from Luton, a whole group of Muslim girls came along because she was so pleased with what happened to her own family. Um, individuals we can take through membership. We don't tend to do adult individual voyages, but if people become members every now and then we might have a, um, a, a voyage that's just a passage voyage that we need to get a few more people on, and we would offer that out to members. Go residentials for the Duke of Edinburgh, that's where Duet comes in. Uh, she takes a small group of about seven people, plus our two crew, and thanks to Christopher Courtauld, who left a legacy, um, we can take all sorts of young people to give them an opportunity. Most of the young people are students, so they come to us, they have to write a bit on their application to apply for funding, um, which, uh, say, we get through this legacy left by Christopher, and um, that, that gives them the chance to take part in, in the residential, and afterwards they do have to write us thank you letters and reports, which go back to um, Sarah, um, who is now one of the owners, which, uh, Christopher's daughter. Uh, and they, once they take part in that voyage, uh, because they tend to be slightly um, higher attaining young people, uh, it helps them um, develop uh, a really good uh, teamwork ability. Uh, they build bonds that they keep forever. And then quite a lot of them will be moving on to university. And we know that very often, it's, it's the, in the interview stage, they talk about their voyage on duet, which we know has helped some people get into university. Uh, again, it's not what we expect, but uh, we are told that happens. Um, so that's good. I haven't got time to talk more than that, as I could talk all day about um, Curden. Um, I've been involved with the Trust for 20 years. And um, I think most people that work for the Trust it becomes our life, and um, as I'm sure it does <laughs> with, uh, with the other trust. But uh, we, we welcome young people from all walks of life onto the boats. Uh, most of them are disadvantaged in some way, but we don't stop other people coming. We have actually got um, Ipswich High School coming on in a couple of weeks' time. The difference is they have to pay the full price, whereas the other young people that come along, if they are disadvantaged or they can't afford to come, uh, we raise our own funds through grant making trusts and individual supporters uh, who um, we put into a pot and then we will help pay for the, for the voyages. I was just talking to, to yourself as I am saying that you know, if a school comes along and says well, we can only afford this much, we will try to cover the rest of our own fundraising. But then occasionally we will go to a school like Ipswich High School that come along and say well, we really want to do it, so that's fine, but uh, you, know, you, you have to pay the going price. Obviously, keeping big boats like we've got is not cheap, but um, again, with thanks to people like Christopher, we keep them going. So, okay. As I can't see it. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Simon Dawes, and I'm here representing the East Anglian Saving Trust this afternoon. Um, do make a noise now and again, otherwise, I won't hear you there. Right? <laughs> uh, um, my delivery this afternoon is going to be a bit of a bit of a, uh, bit of a, um, a sandwich, if you like. It's going to be a little bit about me, so you can understand where I'm at as a disabled person now, uh, about how I used to be. And then a bit about the East Anglian Saving Trust, and then a bit about me again as what I do with the East Anglian Saving Trust as a disabled person. So in short, a little bit about my starting life really. Um, well, I, I was brought up in Malden in Essex. Uh, I left there when I was 21. But as a teenager, as a teenager I learned to sail on the Blackwater with my, my elder brother um, in a little dinghy that we had together and thoroughly enjoyed it. As in all things in life, things move on. Um, I, I left Malden at 21 for my work. I worked at the time for HM, HM Customs and Excise. 
And I moved to Harwich, where I spent five years. Um, I was a shift worker by then, and sailing took a real back, back step for me. You know, I was a young man working hard, uh, trying to save up enough money to buy my first house and things like that. Um, that took me up to about 1988, um, when I transferred, actually I took a promotion to Felixstowe, um, and moved to Suffolk. Um, after a few years there, two, three, four years, I've you know, got a young family by then, and I thought, I really need something to get back in, you know, to do something for me, a little bit of me time. So I bought myself another dinghy, and, uh, and I got back to sailing. So I sailed with the demon, um, and really loved buzzing around midweek on my days off, just for fun, no racing, only myself, uh, just enjoying life on the water, getting back to grips with the winds, the tides, and all that entails. I'm sure many of you can identify with what that, what benefits mentally it brings you, because it certainly brought it to me. Then it got to a point in my life, uh, well, I was about 40, um, my sight started to decline. Um, what I didn't tell you was I was diagnosed at 23 with this eye condition uh, that I was told would kick in at about 40. Uh, called retinitis pigmentosa, and I was, I couldn't even say it back in those days. It is, I was told it was a degenerative condition of the retinas, which comes on a little bit later in life. So when I hit 40, it started to happen, almost to the day practically. And by the time I was 47, I was actually registered blind. In those interim years, uh, between 40 and 47, I still had my dinghy on the Deben, sort of about 40, 42, 43, and I, whilst I was getting out okay sailing, I was struggling to find my way back, uh, back to the ramp, which is a bit anxiety inducing, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, so sadly, I had to give up sailing. Um, I, I had no other avenue of sailing at that time. I didn't know any other group that, that would provide an opportunity or anything like that. But when I became registered blind at 47, uh, by chance I found out about the East Anglian Sailing Trust, or EAST is known for short. So I went along there, that was, that was uh, in uh, 2009, summer 2009, and I went down to the Suffolk Yacht Harbour where EAST has its East Waterside Community Centre. And uh, I was told that they do weekly sailing on the Orwell for disabled people. At the time they had squib sailboats or keelboats, fixed keelboats. Uh, they now run sonars, which are a larger cockpit and a little more modern and a little bit more usable for disabled people. So I spent about a year doing that. It seemed a little bit tame to me after the, the, the joys of running around in my little fast dinghy <coughs> on the demon. But uh, it was better than nothing. Um, but then I found about the other side of East, the cruising side. And I started to take up with that. But winding the clock back slightly about the history of East, it started in 1993 uh, by Mike Spears, who was one of the owners of Suffolk Yacht Harbour, and Bill Smith, who at that time ran the East Anglian Sea School. And they started off what was called uh, the uh, just it's a blind sailing really for taking people out who are visually impaired. So that was 93. And by 1996, um, um, a fellow by the name of Kevin Curtis, does anybody know that name? Kevin Curtis, he was a Paralympian. Um, I can't remember which Olympics, I think it was the 96 Olympics, he won a medal. And he said, Well, what about us, us wheelchair users? You know, how, how are we going to get on these yachts? Um, yachts in themselves are very inaccessible places for wheelchairs, unfortunately. So we started up uh, the formal charity of East in 1997 and they bought these squibs. Um, that has now been running ever since. Um, every Tuesday and Wednesday for any disabled person. We can take anybody from uh, a wheelchair user that can be hoisted into the boats uh, to people with strokes. Uh, absolutely any disability uh, if we can get onto the keel boats and they go for a, a nice sail up the Orwell on a pleasant evening. It's very nice actually all the afternoon. Um, Saturdays is usually uh, reserved for groups of disadvantaged children that they operate with, often with a group called um, Activities Unlimited I believe. 
um, uh, and they they are very well used uh, uh, with those kids. And I think the kids get good benefits out of it as well. But East for me, what, what's East done for me? Um, well, um, as I say, I thought my sailing days were behind me at the age of about 45, and I, and I could, you know, that's a, a terribly young age to start giving things up. When your sight's going on yourself like that, um, and I could see better in those days than I certainly can now. I see all I can make out now is the odd flex of light in here and, and light spots, so I can't see you guys at all. Um, but I thought my world was coming to an end. Um, you know, my life outside, socially, sailing, things like that, it was all stopping. Um, but having found out about East, you know, and made, the, made the, the effort to go down and get to know them, um, I became involved with the cruising side, uh, which was the, the roots, the grassroots of East, and uh, I eventually became their, um, the, the chairman for the VI Cruising Committee which I still am today, I still hold that role. I think they hold me in that role because I'm you know, the figurehead of it. I can't do the admin because I can't see the bits of paper, but uh, <laughs> I have a cruising secretary for that, so that's good. Um, I love it, I just absolutely love it. Um, I know earlier on it was spoken about, you know, and Julia picked up on this about, about it's all out there, about, about the seeing of it, and, and that can't be denied, however, the one proviso I'll put to that is, is that whilst you do need somebody out there who can see, um, I go out there and I thoroughly enjoy it. People say to me, well, what do you get out of it? When I do talks for Reese, I say, well, what do you, do you enjoy about it if you can't see it? And if you ever try going out on a boat and closing your eyes for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and see how you feel about it, what different perceptions do you get out there on the water? You can certainly feel the movement of the boat, you can feel the wind, the direction, uh, what the boat is doing, um, and it's just marvellous. Um, what do I do on a boat? Well, I do practically everything on, on a cruising boat. I do the deck work, I do the sail work. I can't see the telltales on the sail, so I do need help on, on trimming and such likes. I helm the boat. You might think, well, how the hell does he do that? <laughs> well, and you're probably quite right in thinking that. Um, I have um, what's called an audio compass, um, which I was talking about earlier on, um, and it is it is an adaption of an auto helm unit which beeps at me. So if I go off, it is when I'm on a course, when, I, when the skipper has put me on a course, it is set, and if I'm going slightly off course, it will beep at me over a boop, 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 or a beep, 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 mm. telling me if I'm going off to port or starboard. But the more you go off course, the faster it gets. <laughs> <laughs> so the idea is to keep it. To keep it quiet. However, that audio compass system is getting very ancient now and they are starting to break down and become unreliable. So we are currently um, undertaking work and I have just um, done some sea trials on a, on a new system where one of our uh, volunteers comes along with his, with his cruising boat, a 37 foot yacht, and he's got a, a system that, that plugs into the, the ship's compass, electronic compass, and then via a, a smartphone app will then transmit via Bluetooth um, uh, the heading. So it will constantly read out every five seconds the heading I'm on. I find that far more intuitive actually rather than being told by a bop, beep, 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 bop, bop, bop. Mm -hmm. um, for me the heading is much better. I know when my friend Ian, the skipper, he says, oh, can you now still steer 260 instead of going 10 degrees? But I think, well, what is 10 degrees to me that I can't see? If he says steer 260 from, from 200, so I, I, I can do that because the machine's telling me. Um, you know, you guys might look at a compass to do it. I use my ears to do it. Positive mental attitude is what I think is the order of the day when it comes to disabled sailing. Things can't stop, must not stop. You just find a different way of, of doing things. In fact, I said to a friend just the other day who, nothing totally non sailing related, who, who runs a group in Ipswich to do with visual impairment, and she says, Well, I've had to close it down, and I'm thinking of becoming a Samaritan. And I said, Well, that door might be closing, but push another one open. Because if you don't push another door open as a disabled person, you're going to sit in a very dark room 
for a very long time. And the East Anglian Saving Trust provides the opportunity for people to push those other doors open and push the boundaries of getting back onto a boat or even onto a boat for the first time and, and enjoying what I've just been talking about, the, 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 the direction of the wind on your face, the, the fear of the, the waves coming at the boat, the tilt of the boat, which upsets some people, I do realise mm -hmm. that. <laughs> but um, it, it's about getting out there and doing it. Life does not stop as a disabled person. You just find a different way of doing it. The disabled, um, sorry, the East Anglian Sailing Trust, it is totally run by volunteers. We have no paid members of staff whatsoever. Um, we currently run, I think it's five sonars. Um, uh, I think that's how, how many it is, um, which all have to be maintained. Our East Waterside Community Centre, um, we had some people's lottery funding for that, oh gosh, 12, 10, 12 years ago, which is a very usable centre indeed. Um, and we can do little, little do's in there as well as using it as our headquarters for our saving activities. Um, and and it is a, it's a fine organisation. I wanted to keep going. Um, the cruising side of it, we own no cruising boats whatsoever. We are totally reliant on volunteers coming on with their, with their own boats. Um, and the reason behind that is if you can't afford it. <laughs> they cost a lot of money, don't they, you know, uh, cruising boats and the upkeep and maintenance on them. But what I didn't know years ago was, as much as I looked at these boats and thought, well, I'd like to sail on those, what I didn't know was a lot of these boat owners think, well, I've got this boat, I'd like something to sail with me. Um, and, I, and I never knew that back then. And I'm so glad that um, I've uh, found that uh, slot in life. Um, we pay for our, our, our uh, cruising sailing just by um, contributions. It is how much we spend on the boats. So it's for food, drinks on board, um, marina fees, uh, a contribution to diesel. But the boat owner is not allowed to make any profit out of it to avoid any um, coding and um, um, what's the commercial thing? Uh, okay. mm -hmm. Chartering mm -hmm. issues, any chartering issues. So it's just really friends and company on it. Um, the kill boats are slightly different as we own all those and they are fully insured by the East Anglian Sailing Trust obviously. But in essence it means that lots of disabled people get out sailing. On the cruising side, we do two weekends and a week a year. We've already done our two weekends, beginning of June and the end of June, uh, mid-June that was rather. That was last weekend. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it. Um, but um, the September week will be the first week of September, which I should be on. Um, I say should be on because if we get new people that come along, uh, new, new blind people that is that come along that want to sail. I'm always the first person to drop out if there's insufficient space because I feel that I have to lead by example and I get other opportunities. Speaking of which, um, I've just um, had the pleasure of going off to Belgium and Holland last week for a week on, on my friend's 37 foot yacht, um, uh, across from Harris to Ostend and then working up, eventually ending up in Dordrecht where I uh, got the train back to the hook and got the ferry back and the boat owner stood out there. So again, it's about pushing those boundaries. I can't see, I can drive a 37 foot yacht around. Mm. And I think that is just marvellous, I just love it. Um, so the, the East Anglian Sailing Trust, um, if anybody's interested in, in more information on it, uh, please come see me. I do have some leaflets here with me, a few leaflets about the, the cruising side. And indeed, generally for the East Anglian Saving Trust, do look us up on, on our website, uh, just Google East or East Anglian Saving Trust, and it will take you to our website, which I don't think is all that user friendly, but I'm not involved in it, I'm not, even, mm. <laughs> I, I'm not uh, uh, you know, uh, responsible for that. I'm just a mere mortal for the cruising side. Uh, is, do you have any questions for me on here, anybody? Well, they responded back. Hey, uh, please speak up, I can't see hands. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Jules. Hi, um, Jules. I am. Um, uh, okay, it's so a bit, bit of a shoot, a little bit. Um, does your dog come with you, and how does, is it he, she, sorry? He. he. How does he feel if he doesn't when you go off? 
Oh, uh, right, okay. He doesn't come with me. A um, couple of reasons behind that. One, the boat owners don't like their decks being scratched. Mm -hmm. Secondly, going down the companion way to the saloon down below, you try carrying a 34 kilo dog down there. So <laughs> it, it's not good. Um, thirdly, um, where's he going to. Uh, <laughs> you know? And fourthly, where's he going to guide me? Um, nowhere. Um, I, I, I get around a, a cruising boat by touch. Um, I particularly know my friend's 37 foot yacht because I know where every cleat is. I know what we have a system of using the ropes. The master's not going to tell me that anyway. You know, each each line, um, he tells me we have a system of doing it. But it, it's, so it's no point saying pull the rope on, for example. And how is he when I go away? Well, I don't know really because I'm not there. But <laughs> <laughs> my wife says says he's all right. He's, he's okay at home with my wife. He's okay. Um, it's also important for guide dog actually to have their time off as well. You know, we all, we all in, in our working days, or those that are still working, have annual leave. And, and I guess that's a bit like his leave, you know. It's his time off from having that harness around, having to lead me around, thinking, God, I've got to take him out again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he loves it. He loves working, to be honest. But, um, yeah. uh, you know, that's the way it is, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, darling. That's brilliant. Uh, and you, yeah? Yeah. Uh, is it just disabled? Um, yes, for the for um, well, when I say just disabled people, um, yes and no. It is for disabled people. However, we have a strong we we don't just have we need a strong number of volunteers to run it. Um, you know, and all those sighted and able people. So for the the keelboat side, you know, that they're always looking out for volunteers for the for the, for the keelboat on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Um, for the cruising side, you know, for every boat, um, typically we have about nine or ten boats for the weekends. Uh, boat owners come along, and about five or six for the for the week long cruise. But each one of those boats, depending on its size, needs between three to four crew to come on board, as well as the blind people or a person or two. Um, so we need a lot of volunteers. You know, uh, if anybody's interested in it, it, it it's it's there. Um, to join. And, and how many disabled people, roughly speaking, you manage to get a, get a board? Um, on the cruising side, depending on the uh, size of the boat, um, it's one or two uh, blind people. Uh, we can't take people with other disabilities on there, it's purely uh, for visual impairment. On the cruise, on the, sorry, on the keelboat side, um, depending again on the disability, uh, but the sonar's got a huge red cockpit. You can get about, you can get about six, six people in there easy. So with a crew of two, um, so a skipper and, and first mate, you, you could potentially, depending on the, the severity of the disability, have up to four disabled people in there. But it, it, it's usually less than that. Um, we don't like to round them full. And we always have um, a safety boat as well at the same time, you know, a, a rib. Do you find there's a lot of competition there is, and there is. Um, I, I see the emails that come out requesting, you know, are we short of volunteers and such and such a session? Can people step forward? Um, so I think there are favoured sessions, um, maybe. It was maybe the, the Tuesday afternoon or something like that. But, um, uh, you know, the, there's always space. Mm -hmm. Here we go. Okay. I've got a question. Um, for all of you, if you had a magic wand and you could have one wish for your charity, what would your wish be? <laughs> Barely, would you like to? Um, it would be to have um, a benefactor that would be there every year so that we know that every year at the end, <laughs> when the accounts are done, that we would make sure that you know we don't worry about the following year. So, so that would be, so well, your yeah. wish would be? My wish would be to have, yeah, we, we have had, obviously our founder was our first benefactor. Um, he no longer has uh, um, money that he ploughs our way. He, he was a philanthropist, not a businessman. Um, we've had Christopher, but um, other than that, we've, we've never really had anybody um, that's uh, been there to backstop us. <laughs> and uh, raising funds is really hard. That's your wish. Okay. Peter. 
Trust. If the Nancy Blackett Trust had a magic wand, what, what, what would your one wish? Oh, well, be? it would be totally magic wand. It would have been that Arthur Anson had owned and written about a boat that was about three times as big as Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> where we could take, you know, big crews of adults, children, disabled people, blind people, whatever. I mean, the great problem with Nancy is she's so small. I mean, it's very hard to, to make the sort of use of her that would be in keeping with what we really want to happen. So we do, we do try and work around it by uh, short sales with youngsters and by trying to support youngsters who would like to go and sail on something else. But you know, it would be so nice if we had Arthur Bunsen, but we could do it. <laughs> the only thing is, Peter, the, more, the bigger the boat, the more worries there are. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's very true. I can say one of the great benefits of Nancy is we don't have to have the worry. We can just give somebody some money and they can go and do this. <laughs> worry somebody else. Simon, <laughs> what would be if you had your magic wand? In a similar vein to Naomi, um, seeing that the future of the, his charity uh, secured, um, it's always the worry of a charity, isn't it, of, of funding for the next year or the year after. Um, as much as I enjoy saying and I do, do so much love it, I love getting other people to do it, other disabled people. So there's always going to be disabled people, so I would, I would love to see this, the future secured financially and strategically um, to, to give local people that option, that, that chance of, of pushing those boundaries as a disabled person. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, I'm sorry. Can we ask? What does the word server mean? Uh, um, well, it, we, we pronounce it Curden with a hard C. Um, I think you, did you come in a little bit late? I think you did. Yeah. Uh, it's a little bit late. Did you come in a little bit late? The, um, our founder was um, a, a vicar who came into some, a large amount of money and he set up the trust in the first place 40 years ago and uh, his only real indulgence in doing so was that um, he involved his passion of Tolkien and um, Curden is the shipwright in, in Tolkien. So um, as I said, it's, it's a really bad marketing name because people don't remember it. I can see Julia's oh go on then one more. Um, yes, hi, my name's Camilla Herman. I I um, I want to ask all of you and also to express a frustration really. My husband um, Sam and I have been sailing together for um, as long as we've been together. And ten years ago he had a massive stroke. Um, and it's made sailing quite difficult, but we have continued to sail. We have a westerly storm, um, and we almost always sail with crew, um, friends, family, whoever. Um, it's possible to get sail on and off. We use um, the main halyard, and he wears a sling, and he can get around the boat, and he needs a bottle to help. He can do a lot on the boat, but he loves it. But the big frustration for us was that there is a lot of um, support out there for disabled sailors to go on day boats and um, sometimes on uh, cruising motorboats and um, one tall ship. But in, in terms of actually assisting um, somebody who is physically disabled to cruise on a yacht of any kind, there is very little help that I have ever found. Not much advice, not much information, um, and I, I think um, actually Simon mentioned, um, come on, why can't we say that people go cruising? But I think yeah. actually, for a lot of people, it's not an option at all. I mean, if you happen to have a younger wife, which Sam does, and, and somebody who is still determined to go sailing, which at the moment I am, you know, every year is always be the last um, uh, time we go, a bit like Claudia's song, but. Um, but I do find it so frustrating yeah. that it is, there is so little out there in, in terms of, of yeah. support. And it, I wonder if yeah. you have yeah. any thoughts on no, that. No, well, it's something that we we battle with quite a lot. I mean, we, we don't... We, we work with um, disabled people, but we have to make it very clear that we everybody that comes on does have to have a degree of mobility and coordination. Um, partly because, uh, you know, sort of hoisting them on and off in the way that you do um, causes embarrassment for, for a lot of them. Um, our crew are very um, 
used to helping people on and off the boats because quite often the, the youngsters that we work with are very nervous, um, so they have to be manhandled on and off. Um, but yeah, it is a, it is a frustration. Uh, and um, I, I distinctly remember Christopher himself coming down to Duet in, in the latter years and us trying to help him onto the boat. And it was very, very difficult because Christopher was disabled. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's very sad when we see people that have been sailing for many years gradually not being able to do it. Uh, and as, as you said, there is one tall ship, Jubilee Sailing Trust, who, who are set up for it. Um, but other than that, it, yeah, it's, um, it's a problem. From an East point of view on that one, you're absolutely right. If money had been not an object, we would have had that boat today. We would have had it, we would have had it four years ago, five years ago. Um, whilst I was a trustee with the charity a few years back, I did six years of trustee. We looked at this issue about getting um, a cruising boat uh, wheelchair accessible. And we looked at it, and we looked at it, and we looked at it, and we, we even costed it out, and it would have broken our charity. We couldn't do it. We just couldn't do it. Um, if money had been uh, a bottomless pit, you know, it, it, would, it would have took half a million. Yeah. We, likewise, we would, we would have done similar. It's, yeah. it's incredibly frustrating to go along to, let's say, the Southampton Boat Show, which I yeah. often do, and think, oh, there's a boat where Sam could get on, but he couldn't get beyond somewhere, you know, yeah. there's, always, there's always a barrier somewhere in there yeah. because designers aren't interested yeah. in considering people, and it's not just people in wheelchairs, there are a lot of people out there who have dodgy hips and all oh, yes. sorts of things who, yeah. who can't, you know, climb up and down a steep companion way to yes. and yeah. it's so frustrating to look at something like a catamaran, which has a wonderful smooth deck, but the only way to get up it is a, is a tiny little set of Horrible steps, sure. tiny grab it, and you think it's thought about it. We, it better. we actually, on Queen Galadriel, we actually have a sort of a spiral staircase, which sounds a bit odd, but um, it's really quite good for uh, people that um, have mobility problems because they can literally hang on to the, the, the uh, banisters either side and sort of pull themselves up and, and sort of go down on their bottoms. And we found that better than a ladder that we'd had before. So, um, yeah, it's slightly better, but there's always going to be a problem, and um, I feel for you. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. It's, it's, it's like, like, you know, we, we carry on, but I just wanted to express in, in this session. Sure. Oh, yeah. oh, of course, I think that was, I think that was brilliant. And, you know, I, I, I hope that there'll be an article in the Cruising Association. Oh, you yeah, should have happy to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I can't bore all the Cruising Association. No, no, but, but, no, but what you're saying is, and, 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 and you know, realising that I have Elizabeth behind me, um, you know, who was perfectly aware of what it was like for Christopher um, mm -hmm. in his later years. But, in a way, if you look at the issues for people with actual disabilities, what you're also looking at is design issues for all of us yeah. as we get a bit older, older sure. and, and as our hips get dodgier yeah. and our minds get more muddled. I mm. think it's terribly important if you look at issues for people, you know, as Simon has so eloquently raised, people with actual disabilities, you're actually going to make saving more inclusive for all of us as we want to hang on for longer. I think the saddest thing, because as you know, I own the boat um, that, that was designed for a chap um, who was told he needed a marine bath chair. And I think the more we talk about this publicly, um, the more we can all extend our saving lives, which is, which is what we want to do. It's a terribly sad moment, as Claudia's song put, when you have to go on the beach, or swallow the anchor, all these ghastly, indigestible things. So, although we've come to the end of this session, I, I do hope we haven't come to the end of the conversation, because we started thinking we were talking about young people, but actually, we're talking about all of us, um, you know, in different moments of our lives. So, thank you, Camilla, for, for coming up with that. Thank you all. Uh, for, for being honest and, and doing what you can and we all hope that